Back in the summer of 2019, when this country was setting record after record on heat waves, the Democratic leader in the Senate, Chuck Schumer, sounded the alarm on climate change, noting that, quote, July 2019 was the hottest month ever of any month on record, to which Texas Republican Senator John Cornyn responded, quote, it's summer, Chuck. Well, it is once again summer, and Senator Cornyn's state is in the grips of a deadly, record-shattering, again, heat wave. Humidity pushing the heat index above 100 degrees in most areas. Corpus Christi hit an unprecedented 125 degrees in the heat index on Saturday. In Dallas, a U.S. postal carrier collapsed and died in 110 degree weather. In the eastern part of the state, thousands are without power and thus without air conditioning after intense storms over the weekend. And this heat is not a one-off. Climate scientists have been warning that, thanks to climate change, many areas, particularly in Texas, can expect more 100 degree days in future years. Just imagine trying to live with heat like that. David Wallace-Wells focuses on climate as an opinion writer for the New York Times and a columnist for New York Times Magazine. He's also the author of The Uninhabitable Earth, and he joins me now. Um, you know, Texas is a place, like many places in the U.S., that we call the Sun Belt, um, where if you look at migration patterns in the U.S., like people move from places with cold and winter, and they move to places that don't have winter that are very hot and hot in the summer because we have air conditioning. What's going to happen? as these summers get hotter than they've ever been year after year after year? Yeah, there's been climate science showing that what they call an extreme heat belt is going to develop from Texas sort of stretching north. Um, that's going to make days like this, weeks like this, because it may stretch all the way into July, much more common. And that's going to make, you know, put a lot of things under strain. It's going to put local hospital systems under strain. It's going to be hard for people who are working outdoors in particular. Um, I think that we have a lot of adaptive capacity that can make, you know, the death tolls in places like Texas lower than they might be in other parts of the world. But the pinch points are going to hit relatively hard. Labor productivity will go down. And I think over time, we're going to see less um, interest and excitement about living in these places. We've already seen Phoenix has been restricting future um, building and development because of water shortages. And we're probably going to see measures like that unfolding in much larger parts of the country. Yeah, so there's, there's the combination of places that, are, that don't have, you know, winter that are hot and places that don't naturally have water, right? <laughs> uh, that, because they don't get a lot of rain and people like to be in the sun. Phoenix, uh, Arizona saying they're going to curtail new development around Phoenix specifically because of fears of water shortage. Um, there's also something happening right now um, with the ocean that has just never ever happened before. So I want to just take a second to give people like a look at this. Um, the, the, that's the chart of the North Atlantic surface temperature anomaly. That's the North Atlantic, which is actually the, the part of the ocean that the submersible was in. Um, all of those lines in blue there are all of the previous years. This is uh, the National Oceanic Administration's data. And that's us right there in red. Just like, look at that for a second. Everyone I follow in the climate world is freaking out about this. Yeah, and you think how big the ocean is, how much energy it, it needs to absorb to make a record that's, I think it's about one degree warmer than has ever been recorded before. And we talk, when we talk about climate change, these levels of warming, one degree, two degree, each of those marks a whole different universe of impacts and suffering. And what we're seeing now is one degree warmer North Atlantic than has ever been recorded before. So we just took that jump in a single year. Um, and there are whole parts of the ocean, as you can see on this map, um, it's not just the North Atlantic. You see developing El Nino system in the Pacific. Um, you see a lot of anomalous warmth in the Southern Ocean. It's basically everywhere. And the anomaly isn't as extreme as it is in the North Atlantic um, in other parts of the oceans, but it is off the charts everywhere. And that is quite concerning. I think a big part of it is just that El Nino switch, and we are going to be moving into a more erratic El Nino weather pattern. It's going to add some heat to the planet um, over the next couple of years, maybe a quite intense El Nino. Um, but even beyond that, I think that we're seeing something, you know, we're, we're reckoning with the fact that we are living in an unprecedented future today, and we're seeing a hint of just how much more extreme it's going to get. Yeah, one of the things uh, I was just reading through, the, you know, 90% of the, the warming is, is being taken by the oceans, um, which, you know, when you think of it that way, it's 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 crazy to think how insulated in some ways we are from the effects. Like we're, we are not of the of the creatures in this, like in on this planet, we're largely insulated from the worst of this. Um, whereas the oceans are getting tr truly cooked in a way the land is not. I mean, literally nine times as much impact on the world's waters as we're observing as humans walking on its 
land. And that's not just going to be damaging for fish populations and coral reefs, although it will be horrible for them. Um, it also changes the circulation patterns of the oceans, which sounds arcane and, and you know, difficult to follow. But it means that the weather patterns that we've that's, built our civilization around it's will be distorted by these Yes, systems. like the trade winds and El Nino and the Gulf Stream. Like, these are all products of how the interaction of the sun and the sun's energy and the oceans, right? I mean, that's what produces these things. And when you look at a map and you see, oh, wait, actually, like, London is really far north. Like, they shouldn't have temperate weather. The reason they do have temperate weather is because the jet stream performs in a very particular way. And even if that system is not totally shut off, it just slows down or is distorted, it means that there are going to be large parts of the world that are experiencing completely different climates than they were built for. And that'll be incredibly damaging at the human level because, you know, we will not be able to adapt or live through it very comfortably. Yeah, and I also worry about, you know, hurricanes are very complicated and they're very complicated phenomena and they're very complicated to model. Um, but the one thing I feel like I've learned from covering hurricanes for years is like the warmer the ocean temperature, the more energy is stored. And when the hurricane comes over, the worse it tends to be. It's worrying to have all of that energy sitting as a repository, as a kind of battery for storms in the in the ocean. Yeah, and we've already seen a couple of tropical um, uh, depressions form in you know in, in the Atlantic, which is very early for the very, season. Very, yeah, and you know we'll see. As you say, you know you can't really predict a season with much you know precision, but it's not a good sign. It's not you don't want to be heading into a hurricane season with such warm waters as we're seeing now. All right, David Wallace Wells, thank you so much for that. Uh, that is all in on this Thursday night.